Morrow delivers. Swing and a ground ball slowly hit the short. Seeger's got it, throws to first inning is over, and Morrow gets the job done. Second pitcher all time to throw in each of the seven games of a World Series. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Omnipod. Omnipod is the tubeless insulin pump that is flexible, precise, simple to use, discreet, and waterproof. It gives you the peace of mind that I talk about here on the podcast. This episode is also sponsored by Dexcom. The Dexcom Continuous Glucose Monitor gives you the complete picture of your glucose, showing you where it's going and how fast it's getting there. You can learn more about the Omnipod at myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox and Dexcom at dexcom.com forward slash juicebox. There'll also be links in your show notes. The 2017 World Series between the Houston Astros and Los Angeles Dodgers went seven games. It was an incredible series. Each one of those games had one thing in common. Brandon Morrow came in to pitch. Brandon's had type 1 diabetes since he was 18 years old, and he's on the podcast today talking about being a free agent, playing in the World Series, living with type 1 diabetes, and a lot more. You're going to love this. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before being bold with insulin. All set, I think. All set, I think. Yeah, I haven't used the Skype app in a really long time. So that that's everyone who's like, I don't use Skype that often. I'm like, no, I, yeah. I know, but it works great for this. So uh, I appreciate you doing this. Thank you very much. Of course. The podcast is really casual. I mean, I have an idea of where we'll go, but I just want to start talking and, and I think it'll follow along on a pretty good path. I'm recording now. Uh, and just let me tell you a little bit about myself so you know who you're talking to. I'm 40, I forget how old I am, 45, 46 years old. Uh, my daughter My daughter is uh, 13. She was diagnosed when she was um, actually just a couple weeks after her second birthday in 2004. Oh, okay. Yeah, and my son is a senior in high school. Uh, and actually, he just, just committed to play baseball in college. Oh, nice. Where, where at? At Dickinson in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. So he's... um. I don't know if he would prefer me talking to him about this like this. He is short for baseball standards. He is a he's a legit five eleven and uh, a fairly spectacular center fielder. But um, oh, that's not five eleven. Actually, not that short for baseball. I don't think so either. But on the you 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 run into guys who have maybe like a, maybe if you're a pitcher, they might look at you as a touch under ideal height, I guess, but not for a position player. Is that because pitching wise, are, are are they more aware of the angle the, of your release and how close you are to the plate when you're letting go? Yeah, there's there's some advantages to that with height, as far then like extension towards the plate, you know. Yeah, the, I mean, you are you look like you're you look like you're letting go of the ball on the grass by the time you're done. Yeah, I'm not I'm not incredibly tall. I'm six three, but I, I do have pretty decent extension. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, yeah, so it just, it, as he went through the recruiting process, it, what it would happen was, is he would impress people, and then they'd say, we really like you, and then it would be sort of a waiting game to see if they liked somebody who was taller than him. Um, and, and, <laughs> and, and, then, and then there were guys who thought that way, and then there were, and there were plenty of guys who didn't think that way. And the ones who didn't, we just started realizing, you know, why are we beating our head against the wall trying to change people's opinions of baseball? Why don't we go where guys think you're you know, you're a player because you're a player. Yeah, absolutely. It worked out really well. And so he's really excited and uh, we're proud of him because he's been playing since he was four. So yeah, uh, nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I know you were diagnosed when you were 18. Um, and I know you were drafted out of high school, but where were you in that process when you were diagnosed? Had you been drafted already? No, no, no. So uh, the draft was in June. I was diagnosed in January. Um, it was it was before our season had um, kind of really started going. Um, we hadn't played any games yet, and we had probably just barely started practicing. We were out um, doing some conditioning, running, jogging out on the blacktop at at the high school, and I was complaining about all my symptoms. I remember obviously the the 
I didn't have a lot of weight to lose, so there wasn't like the weight loss, but dry mouth, waking up in the middle of the night to have to use the bathroom and also, you know, drinking like four or five bottles of water throughout the night, um, blurry vision, all that uh, fun stuff. And one of my buddies had done a research project or paper on, on diabetes and just said, hey, like, sounds like <laughs> you checked all the boxes, you know, you no sounds kidding. like all the symptoms of diabetes, you should probably check that out. So I went home that night and mentioned it to my parents. And, you know, we went on WebMD. Um, and yeah, I pretty much had every, you know, there single you symptom down the line. Yeah. So we went into the doctor the next day, I think my blood sugar was like 715. So I was on uh, insulin injections later that later that afternoon. Okay. So you're so as a senior in high school in January, did you feel like you were a prospect to be drafted? Did you, it, what was your understanding of your trajectory at that point? Um, I had already committed to Cal, um, but I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't know about pro prospects at that point. I think that stuff started coming later towards the end of the year. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I wasn't like a really big professional prospect in high school. I mean, I was drafted in the 40th round, I guess, if I said, if I really wanted to go, I could have, you know, told them I was definitely going to sign and probably could have gone earlier, but you know, I wasn't that big of a prospect. So they weren't visiting, visiting me like really early on. I see. And so did you think to yourself, I'm going to go to college and come out and get drafted higher? Or were you just like, I really just want to go to college and play baseball. Where was your mind at around that? Um, I think it just worked itself out. Like it, it was just a better opportunity to go to college and I was excited to be going. I knew, I knew some guys that I'd played with on travel teams that were going to Cal. And so it was, it was already a pretty good like situation for me going in. Um, I was really comfortable with the coaching staff, like them a lot. And Berkeley's close enough to where I grew up, but also far enough away to where you you don't feel like you're in the same spot. Um, so I was excited to go and, and the draft stuff just didn't, it didn't make sense to, you know, enough financially to pull me away or from um, that education. Be, yeah. And that experience. Yeah. And so did right. you, did you finish at Cal? Well, I went three years, three so years. I, don't, I don't have a degree, but no, they, in baseball, you know, they, they allow you to be drafted after three. So I had to take that opportunity. Gotcha. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. So I asked all that to just try to figure out what your mindset was. Cause you're 18 years old. You're a senior in high school. You're it, so your mindset is I'm going to college to play baseball with my buddies. This is going to be amazing. Yeah. And and you're diagnosed. You're old enough. Do your parents get involved in your care, or do they kind of just say, "Hey, you're gonna have to figure this out on your own"? Like, what was that like in the beginning? Yeah, you know, it's hard. It's hard to remember, to be honest. Um, I'm sure my mom was involved in staying on me, but I don't remember. Um like her really like lording over me and, and really like hammering down on what I was doing on the time. I, th- I think maybe they figured it was better just to let me figure, you know, it, out. figure it out on my own. Cause I was going to college, you know, I was going to be on my own in such a short period of time. You know, it was just six months later that I was then, you know, getting dropped off at Cal. It was trial by fire. You, yeah. You had to figure yeah, it out. Yeah. I was going to have to figure it out. And, um, yeah, I don't. I don't remember them like holding my hand, really. Well, it's a weird. It's a weird time because it's. I mean, you are you're 18. You're about to leave for school, and at the same time, you're getting. I mean, you just get diagnosed with a with an incurable lifelong disease that takes insulin to manage, and it's it's not easy to figure out. What was the expectation back then for you? Were you pumping right away, or? No, I was. Uh, I did syringes for the first. Maybe like six months, and then I got, I think I got the pen before I left for Cal, and then I had that for another year, so I didn't get the pump until uh, maybe like two and a half years in, Okay. I think. Okay. Were you part of the regular rotation right away, or did you sit for a while? Playing? Yeah. Um, I, I was, uh, I think I started... I, I relieved. I didn't start on the weekends. I think I started some Tuesday midweek games right. and did some relieving on the weekends. But I think I, I, I got in there 
at least once pretty much every weekend. Yes. So you were in the mix and so you were having to manage your diabetes along with playing, not just, not just. Oh yeah. That's the, yeah. Okay. Do you have a CGM now? No, no, you don't. So you, so you, you, so you manage with, you manage by testing your blood sugar and, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. Is it mostly mealtime boluses or do you find yourself testing and making adjustments during the day or what's your, what's your standard day like with Luke with the insulin? It's, Mostly meal time um, until like maybe during the game. If if I'm a little high, um, I usually so relieving. I'll just go to that because that's what I'm. What I'm you're doing now, yeah. Doing now, so yeah, relieving. Um, you know, I check and eat a little bit before the game and head out and kind of hang out for a few innings, and then um, the fourth and fifth inning, I start to kind of get my routine going, and I'll check and then. Um, and sometimes eat a little protein bar or something and, and obviously give myself a bolus with that or, um, make any sort of adjustment. Do you ever find yourself a little bit high? Do you ever find yourself low during the game or is it, is it mostly? Not usually. Not usually. I have it, I have it down pretty good as, as far as my routines leading up and into the game to, to get my so my sweet spot's kind of like between 120 and 140 because obviously I don't I don't that it's like a bad situation to fall low I, I've never been low in a professional game and I've only been low in a game one time starting I used to go low in my pregame bullpens but I, I would have you know five ten minutes to push it to get myself right and that was that was plenty of time but um, yeah you no, just no problems no, no problems in game. You just mentioned having a routine, and I don't know if you know Chris Freeman. He's an Olympic skier who has type one. But no. I, was, I was speaking with him recently, and he called it. He talked about like the preparation. He's like he because he's a cross country Olympic skier with type one. Oh yeah, yeah right. And so he's like, if I prep right, I'm okay. And yeah, and, you know what I mean. I, and I think that's what you mean by routine too. Is that you just you know what works, and you just and you need to put the effort into actually doing it. Yeah, for sure. It's like um, I mean, I, I find I find myself saying the same thing like every time i'm asked about it really it's it's just trying to stay consistent and um if i know what i'm putting in my body and how it's going to react you know you find over time that even though something says 30 carbohydrates on it and you put you know 30 carbohydrates in your pump and it has your ratios all built in and everything else it just it does work. not react yeah. the way that you expect it to so you know, knowing those things, if I have the same protein bar, if I'm at, you know, 165 and I have that same protein bar that has 18 grams of carbs, I know that I can give myself, you know, uh, a third of a unit on top of that. And it's going to bring me down just, you know, just enough, you know, if I, you know, just dial it into 18 and I don't need to make any adjustments and then it's going to be just enough that I need. So staying consistent with that just kind of like takes it out of your mind, like any possible you know, mix-ups or, or spikes or lows that, that you could encounter. You trust that you, kn- you trust that what you know is going to happen is going to happen. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. It's a weird sentence, but I say that on here a lot. Like you have to, I tell people all the time, like, you know, if, like you were just saying, just because a carb count says something, if you bolus something and later you need two more units to bring it back, well, those two units probably belonged in the initial bolus. Right. So, for sure. Right. So the next time you do it, don't count the carbs again. Say to yourself, well, the last time I did eight and it took 10, I'm just going to go to 10. Yeah. Trust yourself and trust what you're seeing is happening. You, you know, so, so you figured out how to do that for yourself. Plus, you're, I find a schedule to be very valuable. Like when my daughter's in school, we have a much easier time keeping her blood sugar where we want it to be because she's regimented and we know what's coming next and we know what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a much better diabetic during the season. My daughter Arden's been wearing the Omnipod tubeless insulin pump since she was four years old. And just last week, as a part of Diabetes Awareness Month, I actually wore an Omnipod demo. You know, I tell you all the time, you know, you should try a demo pod. Well, I tried a demo pod. I couldn't believe I hadn't done it before. So we put it on and I forgot it was there. I couldn't believe it, actually. I thought for sure it would bother me or I would notice it or it would feel like a drag, but it absolutely didn't. When I took off my T-shirt, I was kind of cautious. But other than that, my day-to-day, moment-to-moment, I never once noticed it. It just was really cool. So if you've been thinking about switching your pump or leaving shots and going to a pump, 
I have to tell you, I think the Omnipod's the way to go. For a person who never wore one before, I put it on and I didn't know it was there. And that has to be a big part of this, not being burdened by it. No tubes coming off of you, no things hanging from your belt, nothing to hold on to or remember, nothing that can get caught on a doorknob, just this small little device that just adheres to you and then apparently you just forget it's there. You don't really have to take my word for it, you could try it yourself. You just go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box and you fill in the tiniest bit of information and Omnipod will send you one out. And if you like it, great, just keep going with the process. And if you don't, whatever, toss it away and say, I tried it, didn't work for me. That Scott guy is crazy. But I don't think you're going to say that. I think you're going to say, wow, this is worth looking into further. I know that the Omnipod has been a huge part of how we manage my daughter's type 1 diabetes over the years. It is an incredible piece of technology, and I don't know where we'd be without it. I hope you give it a try. MyOmnipod.com forward slash juicebox. Try a free, no obligation demo today. And he got him. Morrow continues to be lights out. I'm a much better diabetic during the season because it's like Groundhog Day. You know, it's, it's the same thing every single day. You play at 7 o'clock. You get there at 1.30. You do, you know, batting practices at 4. It's the, you, can, you can set your watch. By where you are on the field. Right, pretty much. And, and yeah, I'm much better as far as keeping a schedule during the season. Yeah. Yeah, Arden, um, she's 13 now, so she just finished, like, her. she plays softball. She plays third base, and she just finished Little League. And to give, I know every, a lot of kids play youth sports, but to give you an idea of where she's at, uh, she was her team was two games shy of going to Little League World Series last year. So, oh wow, yeah. So they so she plays and she's little. She's five. You try to imagine she's five three, weighs about ninety six pounds, mm-hmm. and, and throws the ball around at third base like she's twice that size. Um, and it's it's but the once we got into the real into the tournament, and they were now living in barracks and Little League barracks, and it was really. It, it was something like, I mean, the, you, you're used to the travel where you show up on the weekends and, and for softball, they play two and three games in a day and then it's over. Right. And then your biggest, you know, it's easy to keep her balanced. I find it easy to keep her steady during the games. And then you just kind of have to catch a low if it's coming later in the evening. Um, but, you know, when they were playing, when they went to like once a day and then, you know, it was like practice and then they come off the field and they go do other things. And I was like, wow, this is, it was a lot of work. Like it was a lot more work than it usually was. Um, but, but we did find a pattern with it after a couple of days and it, and it became, I don't want to say it became easy, but it, but like you said, like I started to know what was coming and it was easy to, to handle it because I knew. Right. Uh, yeah. That's really, it's very cool. So, so I tell my son all the time that baseball is about playing the next year, like being, being good enough to still be there the next time somebody makes a team, you, you know, um, you know, it, it's great how you're doing now. But, you know, you know, are you going to be there next year? Are you still a prospect for the next step and the next step? And I always try to talk to him about not being too – like I, I always tell him, like, don't ever feel like you made it. In, you know, because I said once you feel like you've, you accomplished what you're going after, you know, maybe that's the – maybe that makes that sort of the end of the journey for you. Yeah. Um, you know, and I wonder – and I watch him do that, and I see how baseball pushes him academically – and then vice versa, I see how the academics push. Like, he wanted to play baseball in college, so he tried harder with his academics. And I believe he would have if he didn't love baseball so much. And that idea of continuing to get better and improve and find a new, like, tier to reach for. Do you think baseball has helped you with your diabetes or diabetes has helped you with your baseball? Or do you believe that they're interconnected in a way that they both, like, inform each other? Or do you not think that at all? Like, I'm just wondering if... If you have that feeling like I see it with, with my kids. I would say probably that baseball has helped me more with the diabetes okay. than the other way around. I don't, I don't think the diabetes helps with the baseball. I don't see how that would. It doesn't make you tougher or more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe there's, you know, there's some things you could, you could guess at. But I think the baseball, you know, you, you obviously have to take your health very seriously. And then there's also the, you know, I have to take my, my health seriously for the, you know, 24 other guys on the team. And that's, that's why I, I, I've talked about before, like, you know, if, if I go low out on the mound, I'm not just, you know, hurting my own statistics or, you know, whatever, having a bad, 
outing just yeah. for myself. Like that's hurting everybody because I'm out there, you know, doing whatever. Then then they have to maybe make a pigeon change, or if I make a bad pitch, or um, you know, can't cover a base or whatever. Right. Whatever. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. And so you gotta, you know, you're not just only doing it for yourself, but you know, you're doing it for all your teammates as well. Yeah. And and you think that does kind of give you the like, but you sound like. I mean, listen, I I, I sometimes think that that athletes don't know how maybe they don't know as much about like like when I talk to my son about baseball and I ask him like how do you do that he just his answer is like I don't know I just I just do it like it's not like he doesn't realize that running he doesn't realize that running you know 50 yards in three seconds and catching a ball as he's careening into a fence is impressive to other people you you know what I mean you know what I mean like he just feels like that's what happens that ball goes up in there I go get it and yeah. uh, and so when it's funny to hear you talk about it a little bit because it is it's a, it's what you do every day is an incredible amount of effort and it takes a ton of focus but I think it's probably just by you being a ball player it's just who you are you, you, you know what I mean like I I don't I don't imagine you know another way to live like if you stop playing baseball today I don't think you would suddenly stop taking care of your diabetes because there was no one counting on you anymore no no but yeah but I think the baseball um, just with, with all the other kind of aspects that, that you think about, like you think about your, your health and diet and, um, because you want to be successful at baseball, then obviously controlling and managing your diabetes as well as you can, it it falls, it falls into that category of, you know, physically preparing yourself to compete. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, are there other any other endocrine issues in your family? Do other people have type one or other other endo issues? No, you, no. Um, you just the lucky one, Brandon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No diabetes. Uh, my my grandfather was type two, but, um, but not like celiac or thyroid conditions or anything. My mom like? has a thyroid condition. Thyroid that, okay. that she um, takes pills for, I think. Um, but, you, find, yeah. you find that a lot. My wife has a hyperthyroid and had it for years after she had Arden, and then Arden was diagnosed, and we didn't even see the correlation until a doctor brought it up one day and said, you'll probably see other endo issues in your family line if you look. And and it was interesting. They were there. It was almost like there were a number of people on the female side of my wife's family who had different endocrine issues, but not one of them repeated. Nobody had the same thing twice. It was uh, It's, it's weird. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I haven't really probably research that so much. So listen, so you're, you're, you're drafted really high. I mean, five is, you must have been pretty thrilled. And, and you head out to the Mariners. Was it your intention? Like, did you hope to start? Did you think you were going to come out of the pen? How did they use you when you got there? And um, I read your draft profile. Do you, I bet you haven't heard this in a while. Fastball splitter duo will be tempting for any team looking for an advanced college arm. With these two pitches, he could move to the bullpen where he has previous experience. Here's the part that I don't know if it's hurtful or not. His weight <laughs> and his diabetic condition make a relief role more po- possible. Do you think baseball saw you as a reliever just because of your size? Or do you think do you think the diabetes had some thought in how people saw you? Or is this just some guy writing BS for a, a blog? Um... It's probably BS for a blog, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that other people didn't see it that see way. See it that way. I know that the Mariners did not, and that the reason I moved to the bullpen early was not because I was diabetic, um, but because that they thought they were going to compete and had a need in the bullpen. Okay. Um, and I know that when drafted, they, they saw me as a starter and you know, allowed me to, to stretch out and have some starting experience at different points throughout my first, my three seasons there. Yeah, I don't think anybody has ever pigeonholed me. Just at least tonight, at least in the like baseball development um you know front office guys. Um I don't think they've ever cared about the diabetes or thought that it was gonna hold me back or anything. There's there's been plenty written on it and you know conjecture as to whether or not I would be able to start or whatever because of it or what I would be best suited to do. But I don't think it ever came into any actual decision making. They don't make baseball decisions based on, on that, on they, things like that. Yeah. They would have let you pitch. And if it didn't work out, then they would have, they would have cut there. They would have made a change, but, but absolutely. No. So you don't see, so, cause that's what I'm asking. So I, because I've interviewed people on here who like, who's 
kids have been kicked off of sporting teams for having diabetes because the coaches were so scared of it. Like, I didn't know it, at what level, or do, do the coaches not even think about it? Do they think of that as something that's between you and, or, and maybe the trainer, and it's not even something they get involved in? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because I've talked to Sam Fold a couple of times, mm-hmm. and, um, and he said that, like, he's, he's heard from Joe Madden, like, that Madden said that you'd forget that he even had diabetes. Like, it wasn't something I thought about when I thought about Sam. Right. Yeah, I'm sure that pretty much every coach that I've played for would, would say that about me. It's, just, it's never, I've never made it an issue. It's never been an issue, you know, when you have it good. And I've always been self-sufficient. The trainers have never had to do anything other than maybe help me, you know, get the phone number of a doctor to get some insulin on the road or something like that. Um, yeah, but they're not involved in your care during the game. or They're not involved in my like care at right. any point. It's funny because even even when I go to back to school night for my daughter, one of the things they'll say is, you know, I was so worried about having someone with diabetes in my class, but to be honest with you, I didn't, I don't remember it anymore. As a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah. if, if my daughter's CGM beeps, the the teacher sometimes don't even recall what it is because it just it doesn't happen that often, and she takes care of it on her own. And I just think it's a good, I don't want to say a lesson, but I think it's good for people to hear that you were able to get to such a high level and such a, a competitive part of life and you're not waving your hands around going, I need help or, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it's valuable for people to be able to hear you say that, I think. And, and yeah, I actually, no, I've been in, I've been a free agent. I think this is the fourth or fifth year in a row. I've been a free agent. And every time, you know, a team asked me like, Hey, what, what do we need to do for you? As, as far as the diabetes, um, we need to connect you with the trainer now, or, you know, what do we, what do we need to have set up when you arrive? And this and that, I say nothing. Right. Like you literally yeah. don't have to do anything. I yeah. you know, take care of it all. Yeah. The trainers like won't even, you know, you don't even see it. Like I maybe change my insertion site like a couple times at the field. And maybe that's the only time you would ever notice. No. Yeah. yeah. Do you, um, so I, it's funny. I just to wrap this up as I, I brought, I brought up my son's height when we started talking because I see that as somebody's like preconceived notion of what a baseball player is. And I, and I, I knew at some point we would talk about this and I wanted to know if you were ran into people who just had a preconceived notion of uh, a baseball player doesn't have a, a health issue to think about while they're playing. And, and it's great to hear that that's not been the case for you. Um, you know, cause it gives everybody hope that, that they can be kind of, you know, counted on their own merits and not, and not have to, you know, not have to worry about people doing that to them. It's, that's, it's really up, you know, uplifting to hear, actually. Right. Yeah. And I think professional athletics more than youth athletics is more of a meritocracy, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, they, don't, they don't care if your diabetes is well controlled or poorly controlled as long as you're, you know, if you hit 25 home runs or, you know, you win 15 games, like they don't care what you do. Yeah, right. So, right. It, it, and if you can, you know, and obviously you want to do everything you can to, you know, play as well as you can. So, you know, taking care of your diabetes is, is obviously one of the bigger things that I have to focus on. Someone told me one time that I think the team I play for just sees me as a commodity. I'm just a, I'm a piece of meat. They pay me. I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to do. And if I can't do it anymore, then that's going to sort of be it. I have to perform to, to, to stay. And, uh, and I, I think that, you know, it, it, it's not a harsh thought. It, it's, I mean, it's a business. It's, it's a great yeah. sport and it's, it's a beautiful piece of, I mean, I could wax poetically about baseball forever and how kind of beautiful and it is to watch and, and the game inside of the game and everything. But in the end, you guys are out there, somebody's paying you to do it and, um, you know, they need you to do it. So, so you think as long as you're not having a problem and you say you don't need anything, they're not going to worry about you again. And that's going to be it that's it's i like it i think it's great i think that people worry about see one of the reasons i love talking to you today is because parents who whose kids get diagnosed when they're younger one of the first things they consider is what are all the things their kids can't do anymore that's their first that's their first worry and to see somebody doing something at such a great you know a, a great way at a great level it really does give people hope that there is really no limits and i shouldn't be placing them on my kids yeah well i think i was fortunate to be diagnosed later and you know kind of already like my parents were like hey you can't do this i would have been you know like <laughs> leave me alone of course i'm going to keep playing baseball like you can't tell me not to go out there and play baseball they would obviously never 
have done that, especially at that point in my life. I mean, I was already going to college to play baseball. Like it was, yeah. and, um, but yeah, when, when, I mean, I'm sure my mom had sleepless nights thinking about what I was doing at school, you know, how, how my blood sugars were controlled and if I was, you know, doing well or not. And those are probably, you know, well thought out thoughts because I know there was times where, you know, I left my vial of insulin in my dorm room or, you know, whatever, until I switched to the pump, really, it was, it was probably a bigger struggle. Um, but yeah, I know like it's, it's tough on, on parents with younger kids. I've, I've spoken in front of groups before and they're always, it's, it's when you have a group of, you know, kids and parents, you're, you're almost always speaking more to the parents than you are to the, to kids, the children. Yeah. Cause they're, I mean, they don't care. They're like, they feel yeah, indestructible. I'm do, right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The parents right. are the ones with all the worries. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So you, so you wear a, a tube pump. So you disconnect the pitch, I, I would say, uh, I'm yeah. saying obviously, right? In, in, when you were starting, did you reconnect during innings or how did you handle that? Because now you're, I mean, I, listen, they pulled you, you, you threw, I can't remember what game it was, but in the World Series, we were, we were, we're Phillies fans, but we were cheering for the Dodgers because of you and, and because I want good things for Chase Utley no matter what. And so um, and I, I, I spent my life pointing to Chase Utley and telling my son, if you play like that guy, you'll be okay. Right. Yeah, that's a good, good thought. I was thinking the other day about this Dexcom ad and that I would have to record it. And I thought, continuous glucose monitor. Those are not sexy words. How do you make that sound exciting? Well, here, if you're living with type 1 diabetes, here's one way. Right now, it's Saturday morning, and I'm editing this podcast, and Arden is sleeping in. Do you know what her blood sugar is? It's 88, and it's nice and steady. And she's sleeping away and resting up, and I am as comfortable as can be. Now that, that is peace of mind. So continuous glucose monitor might not sound fancy or exciting, but it really is. The Dexcom G5 Mobile is amazing, and you should have one. I'm not kidding. You should immediately go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to find out more. The Dexcom G5 features share and follow apps that are available for Android and iPhone. It is FDA approved to make treatment decisions, which means you don't need a finger stick to dose insulin. Really the best part is that you know when your blood sugar is moving and what direction it's going in and you can make these small adjustments to stop it. So instead of getting a high blood sugar that you have to crush later with insulin and you end up low, you just say, oh, it's creeping up. You give it a tiny little bit, you bump it down, you nudge it down, and it's right back again. Just tiny little bumps and nudges that make everything so much easier and keep your blood sugar so stable. It's how we do it. Go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to find out more. If you don't want to use your phone to use your Dexcom, it comes with this really great new receiver. You could just use that if you want to. Not everybody has a cell phone. I mean, you might be... One in like, you know, a bazillion, but hey, you be you. There was one game you threw such a beautiful inning and he lifted you afterwards and I was heartbroken for you. Um, and I don't remember which game it was, but you know, that's your role, right? Like you finish that inning, no matter how good you're going, you're probably not going back out again at this point, at least with the Dodgers this year. Yeah. Most of the time. I mean, um, you know, there, there's, yeah, there's, there's lots of different reasons for that. It's, um, you know, the, the point in the order, how they want to, um, craft their, you know, bridge to get to Kenley Jansen and mm -hmm. who's coming up next. Um, the fact that if I just throw the one inning that day, then I can throw again the next day, right. which during the world series I did. You did every time. Over again. So. Did you set a record with that? <laughs> well, you, you tie a record cause there was, um, and I actually know the gentleman that he, uh, Daryl Knowles is the only other, uh, guy to pitch in all seven games of the world series. I think it was in 73 with, the A's, okay, um, and he was a uh, he was a pitching coach in the Blue Jays organization oh, so when I know. played with him. So I actually knew that about him before I did it. So you know you can't break a seven game record when there's only seven games. When there's only seven games, so, did they take so any of your stuff to the hall afterwards? Yeah, they did. They oh, that's uh, cool. they uh, a pair of the the cleats that I wore and my hat. Oh, that's excellent. 
but you're going to yeah. take a trip when you're older with your, you have kids? Yes, we, yeah. uh, we have a uh, 15-month-old son. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. There'll, be a, there'll be a road trip in your future one day where you point to daddy's shoes. And, uh, <laughs> and then talk. that's yeah. really, is really cool. I mean, you were, so you're, can I ask you something? Because I, I became aware of you, I guess, in Toronto. You and I actually tweeted back and forth years ago, which you would have no idea. Oh, okay. But, but um, I became aware of you there because of the diabetes. Did you, for my first question is, did you cross over with Roy Halliday or did he leave right no. as you were? He was, um, so in the 09, 2010 off season, Toronto hired a new general manager, Alex Anthopoulos. And mm -hmm. his first move as general manager um, was trading Roy Halliday to the Phillies. Um, I'm for grateful every day for that mistake. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, well, they had to. They had to do something. They were they were starting to rebuild, and it was yeah. still great, but nearing the end of his career. Sure. Um, and they they got really good prospects in return. Um, and then, but anyway, the the second move that he made, maybe four or five days later, was um, trading for me from Seattle. So we, um, no, we never we never played each other. We, we never missed being. Crossover teammates for any period of time by about yeah. a week i'll tell you the couple of years i got to watch him like throw every day he, he just it was amazing he just he appeared to will the ball to go where he wanted it to. yeah it was, it was really something to watch him just to go and and we were actually in my son and i were in florida in his last season for spring training and i watched him pitch I was up on a hill. So where was I? The Tiger Stadium. I was in the outfield up on a big berm. So I might have been. To, we might have been at the Tiger Stadium, and he was laboring and laboring. And I've never felt so bad for a person I didn't know personally in my entire life. Like like he, you could see how badly he wanted to do what he wanted to do, and he couldn't get his body to do it anymore. And it was yeah. really, it was heartbreaking. Yeah, you know. Um, but but you're not having that issue later in your career. You're on fire. Um, well, not so, not anymore. I had uh, I had shoulder surgery a couple of years ago. That that um, you know has seemed to clear everything up. I had uh, I was lucky to just have a debridement surgery, so mm -hmm. um, that means they just you know trimmed the fraying tissues and cleaned it up and made it all nice and tidy, um, so nothing was rubbing on on different things in there and pinching and um, no anchors or sutures to fix any tears. Um, yeah, you know, I got really lucky with that, and it really. Um, felt really, really good this year, and um, everything just so much better, and seemed to clean up a lot of issues that I had in the past. Yeah, that's excellent. So you were you you weren't out, but you 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 went to the minors at some point before you came back up, right? Yeah, I uh, so two years in a row I signed a minor league deal. I okay. signed um, so in fifteen after I was done with in Toronto, I, I went to. San Diego. I signed signed a deal to start with San Diego, and I made five starts with them, and then was ultimately shut down with what ended in the shoulder surgery. Um, and then I re-signed with them after that winter and spent 16 with them, mostly in the minor leagues. I tried to start a little bit at the beginning, um, and then started relieving about the All Star break. Made it back up to the major leagues in the middle of August with them um i pitched great but i didn't really have like my stuff back okay like it was okay i was getting out um throwing the ball where i wanted to but nothing was i wasn't impressing anybody obviously because i had to sign another minor league deal um that next year which was before this season so i signed with the dodgers um and i was able to have a full off season i mean because i going back to the year before, even after, right after the surgery. Then that winter, I, I came down with Valley Fever, which is, uh, it's like, it's basically fungal pneumonia, oh, which delightful. you can, yeah, it was <laughs> miserable. So I was bedridden for three weeks um, and really couldn't work out at all. So that was a huge wrench in my plans. Right. Um, but I had, you know, a full healthy off season um, before this last year, came into spring training. I knew things were immediately different um, for the better uh, with my body. And, yeah, I started in, in, in AAA with them. I mean, I threw well in spring, but Dodgers have so many guys. They have so much depth. They were um, so stacked last year. It was crazy. Yeah, um, and they just had 
you know, it was just roster management and, you know, they, they could afford to stash me in the minor leagues for a couple of months. So I, so I stayed down there and pitched and then obviously through, through great when I came back up and stayed the rest of the time. So you sat around, I mean, you sit right around 99, you, you hit a hundred ever. Yeah. Frequ- is it frequently? And was it like uh, that not, before the surgery? It was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could run it up. Um, I could always, I probably hit 98 in almost every start I've ever okay. made minus like the last couple of years before shoulder surgery, probably. Um, and I, I, I probably sat like 94 starting, but relieving. Yeah. I mean, everything gets bumped up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so it, you know, it's funny, I, I can't think of his name now, but he's in the Cubs system. But, but a few years ago, we were, my son was working out somewhere locally here in New Jersey and there was a kid in there and he was throwing he was already in the minors with the Cubs, and he was pumping just like that. But I, I, I asked, we were talking a little bit, and he said, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm like, dude, you're throwing 100 miles an hour. He's like, yeah, he's like, but I get hit. And I was like, wow, that's, first of all, that's insane. And he, he really he had to learn how to pitch. Even just throwing that hard wasn't enough. Yeah. And he, he said, you know, through college and everything, it didn't matter. He's like, I stood up there and just blew people away. And he's like, and I got to the minors, and these guys knocked me around like, I, like it was nothing. And I was like, wow, that, that's insane. So I, I guess my, I, my bigger question is about that is, I mean, it's, you obviously can pitch. You're fantastic. But I was wondering how much the hitting theories in baseball right now affect pitching. I don't know if this is too baseball geeky or not, but I really care. So is the idea of guys swinging for launch angles, did it change how you have to pitch? Um, yeah, that is real baseball geeky. And yeah, that's, sorry. That's, no, 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 that's great. Um, yeah, I think, I think guys going for launch angle and, um, you know, the way they have to manipulate their bat path to get to that. I think that does fall into what the, at least the Dodgers did. Um, our philosophy was high fastballs and you obviously have to have the velocity to throw it there. And then also other fastball characteristics, characteristics like spin rate and rise and, and all that other stuff. Um, and I, I think that guys just have trouble getting, getting the barrel to the top of the zone like that. And and we had a lot of guys with that were really good at doing that. Right. Especially in the bullpen. When a hitter can actually catch one of those, it's shocking. It, it just it, the pitcher looks shocked, the hitter looks shocked, I look shocked sitting at home. Like everybody's like, "Wow, how did you how did you barrel that up up there?" You know. Um, but yeah, but it seems to me that the way the game ebbs and flows, at some point, pitchers are gonna like you know would have been able to devise a way to pitch around what they're trying to do. And yeah, it goes back and forth. I mean, you right. see, you saw so many sinker ballers in the late nineties, early two thousands. And that was combating the, you know, huge home run numbers that you saw then. And, um, and then now guys have, have kind of, you see a lot of good low ball hitters. And, and that's probably partially because there were so many sinker ballers and guys so much, um, you know, p- of the pitching philosophy was just throw it down, down, down all the time. Right. And and you got to learn how to get your hands out then to get under that. and Yeah, and then now you see it just kind of going the other way. It's like a you know constant back and forth fight. <laughs> it's funny. I'm when sure it, it'll continue. You know, it's probably cyclical the way you know everything else is. Yeah. Well, I know my son hopes it doesn't go the other way too soon because he just figured it out about a year and a half ago. So he's, <laughs> he's pretty thrilled at the moment. <laughs> Was Jamie Moyer in Seattle when you got out there? You just you talked about no, his uh, yeah his his last year in Seattle was the year before well, it was the year I signed with the Mariners but the year before that I got to the major leagues I actually played catch with Jamie the day that I signed um, my contract after being drafted wow that's crazy so they He's... they bring you, they bring you up to Seattle and you know do a little mini press conference and then yeah. you, then you sign your contract and I went out and. I changed and played catch with the guys on the field and shagged some batting practice and stuff. So I played oh, catch with Jamie Moore, but yeah, I, that's I, pretty cool. I don't think I ever uh, met him again after that. He's very he he he's very involved in in um, supporting good causes, and I and I know you you really have thrown a lot of your weight behind the JDRF, which I I really appreciate. I think I think a lot of the things that the JDRF does is exciting, uh, but I I'm always most impressed with the 
the work they do in Washington on behalf of people living with diabetes. Like, I think that's incredibly behind the scenes, but very, very important. Do you, do you have other things you do around diabetes or is the JDRF sort of your main focus for your, your advocacy for type one? Um, JDRF has been the easiest, you know, because they're the most prevalent. So they've, they've been the easiest uh, organization for me to reach out to or have them, you know, reaching out to me. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to do as much as I would have liked, you know, after kind of starting to get settled in my career, then I had all the injuries. So when you're not on the field, it's hard to do all the other stuff because you're, I spent so much time rehabbing either in Florida or Arizona that, you know, I was, I was starting to get, especially when I got to San Diego, there's, there's so much in that area is with, medical research and they um one of the owners is is diabetic um peter seidler and and um you know i met him right away when i was there right um and his wife is like the director of the san diego chapter of the jdrf so they were already involved so it was it was a really nice situation for me to get involved in and i did some stuff early where you know kids come out and um you meet them on the field and you talk and it's just kind of a meet and greet. And, and I went and I did a couple, um, events. Um, there was a JDRF one walk or something that, yeah, yeah. that I got involved with. And, um, and then I was hurt. So it's like, if you're not around, you know, it's hard to How do you do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to be involved. So then there was the whole, all, you know, the next year and a half was pretty much a focus of trying to, trying to get back and, and, you know, back to the major leagues and it's hard. And, Obviously, there's you know when you're when you're not out there, like you're not you're not getting the calls to yeah to help anybody out. Well, you know what though, it's I mean every time I've heard you speak, you you talk about it with no fear. Like it's I can see a situation where somebody might want to keep that more private because they don't want to get judged. They don't want people to have cross thoughts about them. But I've always seen you be very just out in front of it. And you know I have diabetes. Doesn't change. Doesn't change what I do. It doesn't change how I eat. You know, like the the kind of messages I think that people need to hear about it, which is you know it's you know it's uh, seeing you talk about it or you know watching the World Series and having I think you I think they started to talk about it one night and then you got the guys out so fast they couldn't get the story out, which was funny and sad at the same time. I was like, oh, they're going to talk about diabetes and Les Brandon just knocks these guys. Yeah, it's over. that was actually I think that was game one. Um, I actually I tweeted out a picture because Ken Rosenthal was wearing his uh, JDRF tie. Okay, he he wears a bow tie every game um, with a with a different organization, a different charitable organization um with their logo printed on it so for game one of the world series he had a jdrf tie which was actually um it was voted in um as you know the game one tie he had it I, I, on whatever website where you know the fans vote on which tie they want him to wear in the jdrf they, did that. Yeah. they voted for game one so he's wearing that i tweeted out a picture with me and him uh, in the clubhouse before um with him with it on but yeah i I think uh, I watched it back because somebody said they were, you know, the same thing. And, yeah, it was funny. It was, I think I, I threw like six or seven pitches, and they, he, he was like, all right, and coming up next. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, I, and I don't think I've ever rooted. Out. Yeah. I didn't root, I've never rooted for anybody to plunk somebody before. I'm like, but he needs a guy on base so they can get this story out. And so, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and then I don't think they ever got to it the rest of the series. But Yeah. No, it's, it, all right. it's cool. Listen, you're doing other things, and it's, it's really cool. I, so, look, just watching you – out there playing. So I don't know if you like how aware you are of it. Like my daughter, my daughter plays salt. Like my son lives and breathes baseball, right? So he's right now wondering why it's not warm out where we are so he can go outside. Um, you know, he's only paying attention in school so we can get to college and keep playing baseball. Like like that. But my daughter's right. good my daughter's very good at it, but she's also the minute she walks away from it, she doesn't really talk about it anymore. Sure. But I saw her stop in front of the television a couple of times during the series. And she's like, is that him? And I'm like, yeah. And then she'd just sort of sit and watch you throw. And then, you know, and she'd get up again. Like, you could just tell it meant something to her that another person with diabetes was, was there doing that thing. You, you know, like it, it, was, me it was meaningful to her to, to see you there. And what I saw on social media and in the, the circles that, that this show travels in is it, it, there were a lot of people 
who felt the same way. Like it, it, it was, you know, I don't know if no one was cheering for you except for the people with diabetes, you still would have had a lot of people cheering, you know? So, um, it's just really, I'm, I'm thanking you when I, I, I have no business thanking you, but I, I, it really does mean a lot. I, you're just living your life, but by being open about it, it means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I and mean, it's something that I just, I, I guess you don't ever think about. Yeah. There'd be no reason to, you just, you're living your life. It's, you know, right. it's, you know, you're just doing it. So, all right, so this podcast is going to go up the second week of November, um, but I, I, I'm going to ask you some questions. I don't know if you can answer or not. So you are a free agent right now. Um, I don't even know if, you, if, if it's smart to say, do you have a place you hope to go? I hear some people talking about you should be going to the Cubs. Some people say the Dodgers are definitely going to resign you again. You're a, you're a hot commodity in baseball. Um, first of all, is, does that feel great? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's good for sure. I mean, um, like I said, last year I signed a minor league deal and it wasn't until uh, the end of January. So to have, uh, you know, teams already, you know, calling on day one of free agency is definitely a different, uh, different situation and different feeling. It's definitely, obviously, the situation you'd rather be in. Yeah. Um, but you deserve it. That's the, that, I mean, first of all, it, you worked at it and you, you mean, you yeah, a lot it, of, a lot it. of hard work and long, long path to you know, navigate my way here. Um, as far as the teams go, I mean, going back to LA would be great. They're yeah. set up to be good for a really long time. Um, I don't really care if I start or close. That's not as important to me as playing for a contending team and, and having a chance to, win a world series. I mean, um, this was my first time playing in the postseason. in my, it was my 11th year in the major leagues and my first time playing in the playoffs. Um, so, and you hear about it and it's different. And, um, I mean, once you get there, you don't, you, you don't want to play regular season games again. You just want to get back so, and do it again. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's, Obviously, the number one thing on my list. Yeah, and are you are you hoping for more than one year this time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I'm in a situation where where I can get command that. Um, you know, two, three, maybe four years. So yeah. it's um, I don't have any. Um, you know, there, it's still a little bit slow. Things are, you know, teams are obviously checking in and engaging in interest, and um, you know, we've been receptive to all of them i don't i don't have any of course. teams like crossed off my list right. um so i think in the next couple of weeks leading into the to the winter meetings which are like the second week of december i think um yeah. that that's when all the action happens so it's just kind of you know sit and wait until then well i listen i don't think the phillies are in a position that you want to be in yet but you could always follow gabe kaplan out here to philly for us because my I, my son came home uh, about 20 minutes before uh, you and I started talking, I said, do you have any questions for Brandon? He goes, no, tell him to come to Philly. And, uh, and, he, <laughs> and he kept walking. I was like, I don't think Hey, they're going to be good, I think. I mean, we we played them in August, maybe, or mm-hmm. early September. And um, it's they, coming got really, they got some really good offensive pieces. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I just, I don't know if... I don't know if it's time to buy, uh, to get somebody with your specific uh, skill set. Uh, I don't know if they're up to that yet or not. Well, it just... I mean, objectively speaking, it just doesn't really, it kind of doesn't really make sense for them right at that point to add, right. I guess I would be like a complimentary piece. Right. Um, you know, they, they're, they're still working on getting all their, all their pieces together. And I'm, I guess I would consider myself just somebody like, if, if you're knocking on the door, just to somebody that can help get you over the top. You're, you're, you're a really nice add to a team who's there yeah, and, 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 and for a team who's struggling or, not there yet. A position like yours is, I don't want to say it's a waste of money, but it, they might not be in a position to use you that much. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. might as well just have, you know, a, a, you know, see what your 23 year old prospect can do at the yeah. same time than rather than signing, you know, you know what, speaking of that, you guys were, you had so many young guys on the field with the Dodgers this year. Do you think that's a trend in baseball or do you think those guys are just special? Because in football, you know, you remember it used to be football. You got drafted. You sat on a bench for a long time. You watched them play football for a long time before you got on the field. Now it's a race to get you on the field. Is that happening in baseball, or we're, or or we're, are Corey and um and um, Bellinger are they just are they just special? Do you think at, at a young? No, age? I think they're just special. I mean, yeah. I don't I don't think most teams 
are in a real hurry to get their guys there. I think actually they, they'd probably rather have them take their time. Um, mm. But those guys are different. It's just different. I yeah. Mean, yeah. That's, I mean, they're, you know, they're Mike Trout and Bryce Harper and they're, they're, and Chris Bryant. They're lumped in with those guys. Like they those guys belong, are so they good. They, on that they, field. Yeah. They're just, yeah, they're just different players. Like they, they belong there and there's, you know, no reason. I mean, if there was a league higher, they'd be in that league. So, yeah. But my, my wife walked through the room during one game and I, I think they had the camera on first base and she goes, is that kid like 12 years old? <laughs> and I, I said, he does look young, doesn't he? I think it's a game you learn, right? Like I think that, I think that is, I watch, listen, it's, my son's not a professional baseball player, but I watch him absorb the game and take lessons out of things. And, you know, we've, we've had weekends where I think an untrained person who didn't understand baseball would think, wow, what a waste of a weekend. And my son will come off the field and go, no, you know what? That's the first time anybody ever hit a ball that high over my head. It was great to see that. And, you know, like, and he's like, and now I know when it leaves the bat like that, I know where it's going next time. There are these little lessons you learn as you're going through. And you have to play the game and watch the game be played to, to absorb that stuff. Unless you're such a super, you know, athlete and, and talented, it just, it just comes that simply to you, I guess. Um, right. I think, I well, think those, I mean, as talented as the guys that we just talked about are, I mean, they're, they still work as hard as anybody and you know, imagine. in between at bats are still, you know, going at the batting cage and trying to figure out what they did wrong with that just one swing and you know, every, you know, everything you just talked about. Yeah. It's funny how video is coming to play. Like I, I'll actually, because through the recruiting season, I was the camera monkey, uh, while I was trying to try, while my son was uh-huh. trying to gain interest, you know, so I'm like busy just holding up, like getting at bats and stuff. And at the first, we just thought we were just doing it to have the video to show people this is how he plays. But at some point he'd start coming over the fence. He's like, can I just see my like second and third swing of that at bat? And I was like, and you could really see it help him. Like, I was like, wow, these these like advanced tools are, are, are real. And oh, yeah. you know, it's really, so I mean, do you watch yourself pitch ever? Like, and or yeah. do you watch the hitter? What, what's more valuable to watch the hitters react to the pitch or watch your mechanics throwing or is there, is there value in both? Um, yeah, there's value in both. I mean, um, you're watching, we're watching for different reasons. I don't, I don't try to do a whole lot of mechanical analysis on myself. Mm-hmm. Um, one, I'm pretty physically intuitive, I guess, um, so I can feel a lot of things and make a lot of changes on the fly. Um, but also, I, don't, I, I, think, I think it can be detrimental to stare and watch it yourself, watch yourself do the wrong mechanics. And if you're trying to fix stuff, that's what you're watching a lot of is right. yourself doing the wrong stuff. So sometimes... I actually watch more video of myself doing well, which guys kind of call it like a, a dig me video, right? So you're watching yourself either like hitting homers or striking guys out, but uh-huh. you're also reinforcing like good mechanics, like in your mind, if you're watching yourself throw great pitches, then you're kind of like, I guess one building your inner confidence, like, Oh, look, you know how nasty I am or, or whatever. But you're also watching yourself, with good mechanics because to throw a good pitch, you have to have good mechanics to throw it. Um, and to make a, you know, to hit a homer, you have to have, you know, good bat path and, and good swing mechanics to get the barrel there. It game um, is amazing. You have to believe in yourself. Like you have to believe you can do it oh, and, yeah. not, and not think about it. And you, I'm thinking about you pitching right now. You're, you're, you're an athlete. Not some, there used to be a, there used to, there can be a delineation. Some guys are just pitchers. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like they're, yeah, they're yeah. throwers. They get up there, then they throw, but you're athletic. So you, you, it's. I, I'm really drawing a line here with my son because it's where my it's where my experience is. But like, like seriously, when I, I'll say to him sometimes, like I saw him catch a ball one time, like it was every bit of 400 feet and over his shoulder, and it looked like he w- we were standing in the backyard, and I just flipped it to him. It was amazing how clean and easy he got to the ball. And I pulled him aside as his father, amazed. I said, "How do you do that? Like that's that's amazing." And he's like, "I don't know." He's like, "You just, I just go." And I'm like, wow, that's he doesn't even realize how athletic he is, and and to see an athletic, I, so what I'm so excited about about baseball nowadays is watching real, genuine athletes play baseball has elevated the game incredibly, 
And uh, th- they're not just guys who play baseball anymore. They're, they're like legit world-class athletes. And I think maybe that's what you have going on is that your body just does what it does and you trust it and, and you can feel it. Y- you know, it's, uh, it- it's just very cool to watch. I, I sounded like I was going to ask you out on a date there uh, for a second. I apologize <laughs> about that. But um, it's just if you love baseball, it's really great to watch. Y- y- you know, and so. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, you definitely don't see. I mean, it's more of a, I guess. With the body types, anyway, it's more of a throwback body type, like a Mickey Mantle, Lou Gehrig, Ted Williams style, mm-hmm. like body. Where you, you, obviously with the the PED era, you saw big hulking guys busting out of their uniforms and yeah, yeah, yeah. flicking home runs out. And um, yeah, I think the value teams put on speed and defense has gone up a lot. So obviously, to play good defense, it's, it's going to help to be faster and in better shape and be able to get to balls and um yeah you definitely see a lot more just pure athletes than you did maybe 10 15 years ago i appreciate watching it like i think it's i think it's amazing i appreciate watching you this year and i know everybody else did too i'm gonna i'm gonna let you go in a minute but um i just let me tell you thank you for for coming on and doing this i i genuinely appreciate it so this is my last question right like it you 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 made a statement earlier about like now you almost don't want to play a regular season game. You want to get back to the World Series. Did you have that moment where you were like, "Wow, I can't believe I'm here!" Like I we did it. I did it. I'm here. And and I and I don't want to bring you down, but like how how was it crushing to lose, or was it amazing just to be there? Because if as people who watch those games, those two those two teams were amazing. Like every at bat. I didn't know which way it was going to go. Every inning, you didn't know which way it was going. You had a feeling like if this game kept going on, they both could win it. Like it, it had that weird like vibe. Like you almost didn't get lucky to come up against a team that was just not quite your equal, right? Um, on both sides, you know. And what does it feel like? I mean, I don't know if you can or you want to articulate, but what does it feel like to get that close to something and then not quite get there? Does it just keep you hungry, or how would you describe it? Yeah, I think it. I think when you get a, you know, it's cliche, but when you get a taste of it, mm-hmm. then you're hungry for more, I guess, to be, to, to finish off of, you know, huge cliche there. Um, but it's true. I mean, like, yeah, it was, there was every emotion involved. It was exhilarating and thrilling and the best thing ever, but also the worst and crushing and heartbreaking at the end and and but i mean it was obviously an amazing amazing experience and and like i said like the regular season just the grind of that is is different and um you know the the postseason was it was awesome yeah well you guys gave me a real gift and i'm sure a lot of other people too but i that one night the game just went on forever i forget how many innings it was but my my son and i sat up together and and cole and i were watching the game and at some point and i i got a little melancholy and i said hey this is probably the last time we'll sit down and watch the world series like this you're gonna go you're gonna go to school you know and, and you'll be in college the next time the series is on and he he's you know he's He's a he really is a ball player. He's a, kind of he's a quiet kid. He doesn't say a whole lot sometimes. Mm-hmm. And he just really like very just kind of earnestly said to me. He goes, "No, no." He's like, "The Phillies will be in it next year. I'll come home and I'll watch it with you." <laughs> and I was and I was like, "Oh God, I'm gonna cry." And so like you know, and, but it it gave me that moment, one o'clock in the morning, where I I was having such a great time with my son and just watching the game. And uh, I mean, the only complaint I have is it would be nice if they start the games a little earlier. But other than that, it's <laughs> it uh it was really. It was just a really nice moment to watch. You know, I, I just think that, that baseball is, is, is um, it's so much more than people who don't love baseball think it is. And, and I just, I appreciate having it. And you guys created that sort of moment for probably a lot of families. So it was really cool. I hope yeah. you do it again. I hope you go back to wherever you, wherever you want to be and, and you crush it again the way you did because it was, it was really exciting to watch. Yeah, so, yeah, no doubt. Thank you very much. Huge thank you to Brandon for coming on the show and talking about playing in the World Series and living with type 1. Thank you also to the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation for helping me set this interview up. Thank you, JDRF. Enjoying the Juice Box podcast? Press subscribe in the app you're listening in right now. You'll get a new episode every week. Thank you, Dexcom and Omnipod, for supporting the podcast so generously. Go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box or myomnipod.com forward slash juice box to find out more. 
So this is his moment. Morrow delivers. Swing and a ground ball slowly hit the short. Seeger's got it, throws to first inning is over, and Morrow gets the job done. Second pitcher all time to throw in each of the seven games of a World Series. Hey guys, Bold with Insulin t-shirts are available now at juiceboxpodcast.com. Let the world know you're bold. Could have become a free agent. Dodgers gave him that chance, and did they find lightning in a bottle with Morrow, who strikes out three batters. He's been doing that all postseason long. What a pitcher.